Well, Saskatchewan's power system is changing. Aging infrastructure, a need to transition to clean energy is driving the change. But what is the best way forward? Well, this evening, Sask Power is holding a nuclear power and small modular reactor information session. The Crown Corporation has another session about renewable energy coming up. We know uh, many of you have questions about power generation in the province and Saskatchewan's commitment to a net zero emissions target by 2050. Well, today you have a special opportunity to ask your questions about the future of power generation in the province directly from Sask Power. Doug Opseth heads up Generation Asset Management and Planning with Sask Power, and he joins us for the program today. Doug, thanks so much for your time. Yeah, thanks, Carl. Thanks for having me on. Um, Doug, let's start with what's happening tonight. SAS Power is holding an information session about nuclear power in the province. Um, what, what role do, do you see for nuclear, uh, you know, what, what role do you see it playing in the power grid going ahead? Yeah, well, it was a great question. You know, certainly tonight is one of the sessions we're having. We've been having lots of information sessions in the public to to provide information and, and hear comments back from the public on, on the energy transition we're going through. Uh, tonight's event is about nuclear power. And, you know, I think it's it's one of the one of the options we're looking at in the future. There's certainly no decisions have been made yet, but certainly, you know, we're doing a lot of work right now to enable a possibility for nuclear power to come to Saskatchewan in the coming years. Now, according to SAS Power's September 20th Power Talk slides, the levelized costs of a conventional nuclear reactor is estimated as somewhere between $155 per megawatt hour to $305 per megawatt hour, and that $305, uh, that's pretty high. Um, we're we're going to see how much it costs to build a small uh, modular reactor as Ontario builds the first in Canada, and I understand you expect to see those numbers by 2028. At what price point, though, do we say that new nuclear is probably too expensive? Yeah, well, that's a great question. It's certainly a question we get asked a lot. I don't know. At this point, it's, it, we're not able to say exactly what the cost is. And I'll say the cost at this stage is, is not the most important factor. Certainly, as we move down the path and get to the point of actually making a decision to proceed in 2029, certainly at that point, we'll have to assess uh, the cost of what uh, a nuclear option would look like relative to other supply options. You know, we're doing lots of work to develop other options as well in addition to nuclear power. But it's just one of the options we're exploring. Well, okay, when we look at those numbers, and, and you know, granted, Doug, it's a, it's a big spread, you know, 155 yeah. to 305, it's a big spread. But how do those numbers compare with the cost of generating other forms of electricity? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. You know, each form of generation has uh, different costs associated. And certainly when you look at those costs, I'd say I, there's certainly other options we have right now. If you look at just straight natural gas on our system, may come at a lower cost right now, but comes with carbon emissions attached to it. You know, I think the important thing is when we get to 2029 or in the future where we're looking at non-emitting baseload supply options, I think they're all relatively in the same uh, range of prices. So those would be things like carbon capture on natural gas, you know, new hydro electric development and nuclear power would be in, in, in the relatively the same range. And a lot of the work we're doing right now is to try to advance these these options to the point where we could make a decision whether to proceed. Okay, folks, uh, our guest today is Doug Opseth from Sask Power. He's here to answer any questions you have about uh, the plans Sask Power has to transition to net zero by 2050 or perhaps even earlier. Uh, lots of things on the table, lots of possibilities here, and I'm sure many of you have questions about SAS Power's plans. Doug, let's bring our first caller into the conversation. Kathy's sure. in Regina. Hi, Kathy. Well, hello. So this might be just a little bit of a broader question first, but I can tailor the conversation following here. Doug, I would like to give you... Well, I would like you to give me some optimism about why I sh shouldn't be so horribly suspicious about the minds that are directing this. And where I come from first is these are senior engineers and engineering field people that are recommending that these are best ways to go. And I really get the sense that there's not much younger leadership under you folks that have the courage to stand up and say there are other alternatives, there's a better breadth that we can working on, and you folks are dealing with old school stuff. That's a big problem with our province, dealing with old school always. What, what are you referring to, Kathy? Specifically, what are you, are so you referring to, know, nuclear? Department and the age of them. Yeah. Okay, uh, all right. Doug, do you want to okay. weigh in yeah, on that? Yeah, like, well, maybe I'll, 
maybe I'll just give an analogy to the planning we're looking at right now. I think, you know, we haven't made decisions on, on which path we're on right now. You know, there's a lot of options being considered as we move out to 2050. And, and maybe if I can use an analogy for a second, it's like you're planning a long vacation with your family. So if I'm planning a vacation, it includes my my sister's family and my parents and others. We know where we are today. We're here in Regina. And maybe next year we want to go on a trip to to California, for say, say, for example. And there's different ways of getting there. You can take a plane, you can take a train, you can drive your car. And each one has its pros and cons. You know, a plane might be faster, uh, but cost more. A car might take longer and let you stop off and visit relatives on the way. And the work you do before you make the decision to proceed on that path is to engage Engage with your family members to pick that path, and I think that's the work we're doing right now. You know, we're we're out in the public. There's lots of different pathways to get to the future. You know, where we are right now is we're primarily a fossil fuel utility with a commitment to provide safe, reliable, and cost-effective power for our customers. We know where we want to be in 2050 is we want to be a utility that is, you know, net zero or zero emissions on the grid that still provides safe, reliable, cost-effective power for our customers and that has uh, still has that commitment to provide safe, reliable, and cost-effective power for our customers and is serving a, a higher load as well. And the work we're doing right now is to go out and engage with the public to get the public's view on which path we should be going on. Because Unfortunately, there is no perfect path to go forward, um, and so we need to get them want to get the public's input on what things are important. Some customers view cost is the most important thing. Some view, you know, getting our emissions down as quickly is the most important. Thing. And so, certainly, fa- those kind of conversations we're having will be factored into our decision making. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, to Kathy's point, though, Doug, if I if I may, uh, Kathy wants sure. to know who's who's going to make the decision. Um, you know, do, do, yeah, do, you, I, I, do you have do you have names? Do you have uh, positions that, uh, that that will ultimately decide? Yeah, I don't know if there's one person who will make this decision. I think certainly at the, at SAS Power, our job right now is to come up with different options to facilitate different pathways into the future, so that we do have options. You know, one of the challenges we have as we go into the future is there's not a lot of base load non-emitting supply options available to us so we need to do the work now to develop them so ultimately the decision uh, will be made by in combination we will provide information and we'll, we'll get information from the public and, and certainly feedback from the government before we make any decisions so there's a lot of input coming in so there isn't one person making these decisions it's it's a combination of getting information from a bunch of different sources you know learning what's going in other jurisdictions to help inform all these decisions well, how much of that decision is, is going to be political in nature? How much of that is going to be made by government and, and sort of uh, SAS power will be told what to do? Yeah, I don't know. I, I think our job is, as a Crown Corporation is certainly to provide information to the government and so they can make an informed decision on which pathway we go down. But I think informing our recommendations and our information we provide will be feedback from the public on this. Well, uh, Doug, let's let's just take a, a, a step back and look at the big picture for sure. a few minutes. Just just what technologies are being considered to achieve yeah, like, that that goal of net zero by twenty fifty? Yeah, we're we're looking at a bunch of different technologies. I think people are familiar. Maybe I'll just by way of uh, setting some context. You know, we've got two main sources of power we have in Saskatchewan. We've got you know we've got the intermittent or renewable generation things that are there. Uh, when the wind is blowing, when the sun's shining, and then we have our base load generation. And those are the things that provide power 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And we need both of these supplies to help power us into the future. And certainly, you know, we're looking at wind power. We've got lots of wind we're deploying on our system. Uh, right now, our base load energy supply, so that's the, the energy that, that backs up renewables and is there whenever we need it, you know, primarily comes from, from coal and natural gas. So a lot of the work we're doing right now is to develop new options in the future. And so that would be, you know, new ways of of deploying renewable generation. We're looking at things like battery storage and energy storage and different types of storage. Uh, We're looking at things like nuclear power from small modular reactors. And we're looking at things like carbon capture and natural gas. You know, the the challenge for a utility like Saskatchewan is is we don't have a lot of non-emitting baseload energy supplies right now available to us. Jurisdictions like British Columbia or Manitoba or Quebec have, have, have the benefit of having lots of hydro potential to develop in those jurisdictions, which is non-emitting and helps them get their targets down. But places like Saskatchewan, Alberta, you know, we've relied historically on things like fossil fuels. We relied on the coal we've had and we relied on natural gas to, to develop the problems to where it is today. And the work we need to do now is to develop these new new supply options. All right, folks, if you're just joining us or if you have just joined us, uh, we're talking about uh, what Sask Power is considering 
to transition to a net zero power grid in Saskatchewan by 2050. There are a number of things uh, on the table, and we'd love to hear from you today, folks. Uh, What thoughts do you have on how Saskatchewan can transition from relying primarily on uh, natural gas and coal to other forms of non-emitting electricity generation? And uh, one of the options, of course, that is being explored are small modular nuclear reactors, among other things. Uh, Doug, before, before I forget, uh, you, you mentioned uh, earlier on uh, while, while you were talking about uh, uh, potential of hydro. Um, does, does Saskatchewan have any hydro potential left? Yeah, like by virtue of Saskatchewan, I think I, you know, I grew up and I live in Saskatchewan. I know it's a relatively flat province, so you know we've developed a lot of the hydro potential we have here in Saskatchewan. You know, we are considering some additional hydro facilities in Saskatchewan, but but the reality is, for a place like Saskatchewan, hydro will never replace all of the base load coal and natural gas we're requiring. So it certainly it may play a part, but we just don't have the benefit of that. You know, and coupled with that too, there's some of the hydro sites that we may, that would potentially be developed in Saskatchewan are in incredibly environmentally sensitive areas in northern Saskatchewan where, you know, we may not even get approval to construct facilities up there, even if we wanted to. So hydro will play a part, but it won't be the full solution for, for SAS Power making that transition. To that I'm not sure if you know off the top of your head, but uh, how, how much, uh, what percentage of our, of our current baseload comes from our two uh, major hydro projects? Well, right now we get about a hundred and about 1150 megawatts of hydro coming both from our existing hydro facilities and a little bit of imported hydro from Manitoba. So it accounts for about 21% of where we get our, our generation capacity from right now. Okay. Uh, we're going to go through the phone lines again right away quick, but uh, we, we, we are using terms that maybe not everybody understands. Sure. And one of those is megawatt hour. Just what is that? And and what does that yeah, mean for maybe number it, it, of houses? It's, or... it's, yeah, it's a unit of power we have. I think a one megawatt, I think power is about, uh, oh, I have to get the number exactly how many, but it's a unit of power we use. So right now in Saskatchewan, we uh, have about 5,000 megawatts of total generation capacity, about 5,400 megawatts of total generation we have in Saskatchewan. Um, and on a, our peak load is a little under 4,000 megawatts, about 3,000 megawatts. And, you know, a megawatt, I think, powers about 1,000 homes in Saskatchewan. Okay. okay yeah, uh, and maybe... Oh, oh, go, go ahead. ahead. Oh, I was going to say, I don't know if I did a good job explaining base load power or intermittent generation, but happy to come back to that down the road. Okay, well, let's uh, let's take a, a few phone calls here. Uh, Rhonda in Regina. Rhonda, we're pretty busy today, so I'm going to have to limit you to two minutes. Go ahead. Okay, all right. Uh, so, firstly, I just want to say thank you uh, for this program and uh, for the guest from Sus Power uh, being on the program. Uh, I'm a person that is uh, deeply concerned about how far behind we are in tackling our climate crisis. Uh, the UN uh, Secretary General is saying we're not in uh, climate warming anymore, we're in climate boiling. So, um, yes, I would really push SAS Power to look at a variety of um, technologies. And one I want to present uh, from listening to a number of different programs is um, individual wind turbines. Now, these apparently are placed on top of already existing power poles and then connected, of course, to the, uh, can't get the term, the wires. Um, And the advantage of these is that then uh, in one area you would have wind uh, turbines that are, are turning because there is wind in that area when in another area those turbines may not be uh, functioning at that point. And it's already then using uh, existing structure uh, to uh, to implement uh, this technology. So I would uh, like to uh, present that as something also to be investigated. Okay. All right. Thanks, Rhonda. Um, Thank you. Doug, uh, the, the the technology Rhonda's talking about is in use, uh, I think, in some European countries, but. Um, what do we know about the efficiency of a small wind generator versus the, the larger commercial wind generators? Yeah. So certainly, you know, wind power is a huge part of our plans to get to net zero. You know, we have plans to add 3,000, up to 3,000 megawatts 
of wind by 2035. You know, when you look at wind power generation, certainly there are technologies that generate on a smaller scale, you know, what we just discussed. The challenge is typically when you get look at the economics of it, it's, it's much more economic to generate on a large scale uh, when you're looking at anything like wind power or solar power. And and when we're trying to be mindful from a, a utility perspective on, on our impact on costs and rates, we tend to look for the lowest cost way of doing that. And right now that's through large large wind farms. But certainly we know we have looked at technologies like this. We looked at a, an option that was similar to that with solar panels on the top of of power poles and light poles around. And and certainly there's a lot of innovation going in this area. And we certainly do uh, try to stay up to, to date on these things and certainly take a look at these things. And certainly, you know, at some point in the future, this might be an option that we would consider. Okay, uh, we're going to take a news break here in a few moments. We're going to take a call first. It'll be from Richard, west of Moose Jaw. Hi, Richard. Hello. Yeah, go ahead, Richard. Hello. Yeah, go ahead, Richard. Yeah, I have a question. Yeah, I have a question for the gentleman from SAS Power. I think that what you're presenting today is already politically tainted because you keep talking by 2050, but a federal government says by 2030. Why do we need in this province 27 years? Can this not be underway and well done by 2030? Thank you very much. All right, thanks for the call. Yeah, no, that's, that's a question we get asked quite a bit is, is, can we go faster on this? And I think, you know, as a province, we've indicated that, you know, what the federal government is asking in terms of being net zero by 2035 is not possible uh, for SAS power. And I think what the federal government is hearing from many provinces is that's not a possible uh, target. target. And, and the three main reasons are it's, it's, it may seem like a long time to 2035, 12 years, but that is not a very long time. You know, SAS Power has been in business for close to over 90 years, and it will take time to transition. You know, a lot of the, the infrastructure we need to build is not available quite yet. It takes time to get it built. There's also a tremendous cost to, to, to advancing our plans from 2050 to 2035. You know, a good example of this would be if you're doing a home renovation and you have a whole bunch of renovations you want to do. Likely, like for myself, I couldn't afford to do all those renovations at one time, so I spaced them out over years. And as you try to advance those things to do them more quickly, it costs more and has a bigger impact on, on my budget at home. And certainly, as we try to advance our plans from 2050 to 2035, it has a much bigger impact on the cost of electricity for our customers. And the third main reason why 2035 is not achievable for us is, is some of the technologies we're going to rely on to get there. Those are those non-emitting base load supply options. Those would be things like nuclear power from SMRs or carbon capture on natural gas or even new types of battery energy storage. They're not quite yet available yet. So that's what makes it you know, impossible for us to get there to, by 2035. Certainly, we are doing work right now. We've had plans in place to get to net zero by 2050. We're doing the work now to see, you know, can those plans be advanced at all? But 2035 is just not a reasonable target for or an achievable target for SAS Power. Doug, SAS Power had been planning on building uh, several new natural gas power plants, and the federal regulations would allow that to those plants to be built, but they would need to be equipped with carbon capture and storage. Is SAS Power still considering building natural gas plants with uh, CCS? Why or why not? Yeah, certainly natural gas will play a role in our energy transition. You know, as we're transitioning away from conventional coal, uh, we need something to bridge the gap between that point and 2030 and when we're going to have new supply options. And maybe it'll be from nuclear power and maybe it'll be from something else. But in the interim power, we, we, we do need to have natural gas built to provide that base load energy supply here in the, in the province and, and to provide a growing amount of power here in the province. So we will continue to build natural gas. You know, we are doing work right now to look at what would it take to convert some of those natural gas plants either retroactively or in the future to carbon capture and storage and a lot of that will depend on what comes out in the final uh, regulations that are released next year well wouldn't it make sense to include carbon capture and storage in a new build like yeah well, shouldn't right you now kind we of have... solve that before you go ahead and build I guess part of the challenge is some of our plants and our most recent plant or Aspen power station that we're looking at constructing up near Lanigan, it's already in the planning and engineering stage. And, and for things like carbon capture storage, just like for things like nuclear power, there still is work that needs to get done to get that technology to the place where we could make a decision to deploy it. So uh, we'll need to continue to build natural gas. The work we're doing right now is to say, how can we advance that technology to a point where we could effectively deploy it? You know, right now we don't have a good handle of exactly what the cost 
cost would be for deploying it. So we need to do a bunch more work before we're willing to make that. Well, of course, SAS Power has some experience with carbon capture and storage, some very expensive experience. Uh, is, is that technology ready to go um, yeah. as, as it relates to, to natural gas? Well, I think right now we have lots of confidence. So certainly we, we operate the world's first carbon capture and storage facility on a large scale at our Boundary Dam Unit 3 facility. And, and there's a lot of learnings we got as we developed that project and have it running really well right now. So certainly some of those learnings could be translated to a natural gas facility, but a natural gas facility has a lot of dip, has enough differences that we need to take a look at it before we're willing to, to, to build it and make a commitment to it. But I will say, you know, there are a lot of jurisdictions in Canada, uh, including in Alberta and, and elsewhere, that are looking at that same technology, and, and we continue to work closely with them to advance that technology to a point where we would be able to make a decision. Okay, before we go back to the phone lines, uh, we got a news release yesterday about a study exploring the potential for carbon capture and storage hubs anchored by minerals and power production. Uh, can, can you help us make sense of what all that means, Doug? Yeah, like, certainly w whenever you have a carbon capture and storage facility, one of the questions is what are you going to do with the CO2? Um, and so right now with our Boundary Dam Unit 3 facility, we, we sell the CO2 for enhanced oil recovery. We also have the option of injecting it underground into a long-term storage facility. But just like SAS Power needs to bring our emissions down, what we're seeing is a lot of industrial processes that rely on natural gas. So those would be things like some of the potash operations and things like the refinery here in Regina. They also emit CO2 by burning natural gas. Um, and so they're looking at how do they capture their, their CO2 and then what do they do with it? And so one of the things that's being contemplated is the ability to set up, you know, a CO2, potentially CO2 pipeline and a hub that would allow businesses and maybe a SAS power as well to put all of our CO2 into a common pipeline uh, for either sale to somebody or maybe for long-term storage. I think there's just a lot of efficiencies to be gained by everybody working together on that than, than every uh, company or utility doing it on their own. Okay, let's go back to the phone lines now. They are full. We'll start with Jim in Saskatoon. Hi, Jim. Hi there. Yeah, go ahead. Um, I've got... Uh, uh, can you hear me? Yes, we hear you fine. Go ahead, Jim. Okay. Uh, uh, back in the 1960s, there was a, a report done for Saskatchewan Power that identified 15 possible sites in Saskatchewan for hydroelectric power. And so far, only three of those have been developed. I just wondered if there's any plan to develop the other 12 sites. Yeah, no, hydro is certainly something we're, we're continue to take a look at. You know, we, we've looked at a lot of hydro facilities, potential hydro facilities in the province. And, you know, when we've looked at in the past, sometimes they haven't proven to be economic or when you do more engineering on them, they just haven't proved to be feasible. But the work we're doing now is we're looking at, at this energy transition. We're really looking at a lot of those sites to see if there's potential there. So certainly there are a couple that have potential, but likely there's not enough. I might say that certainly there's not enough hydro potential in Saskatchewan to replace all of our retiring coal and natural gas and serve future load in the future. But, but certainly, just like with, I guess, we are looking at all technologies right now for this energy transition. You know, we haven't made final decisions on things, and certainly things like hydro, battery storage, we're, we're investigating all of these things to find the best path forward for SAS power on the province. When you look at those hydro projects, what are you looking at, Doug? Are you looking at, like, you know, big uh, facilities like we see at, at say, uh, uh, the Gardner Dam, or are you looking at, at flow of stream generation? What are you looking at? Yeah, we're, we're, I think we're looking at a combination of them. You know, certainly there's at least one site that has the potential to be a larger hydro facility, a couple of hundred megawatts possibly. But we're also looking at lots of smaller sites. You know, the reality is we have many more smaller sites, which would be more what you would term a, a run of river facility, where we're not really pounding, we're not really storing any water behind it. More or less, the water just flows through it in terms of turbine when it's available. So we're looking at a combination of those sites um, in Saskatchewan. A lot of them happen to be in northern Saskatchewan, uh, but we are looking at some in southern Saskatchewan as well. Okay, back to the phone lines. We'll go to uh, north of Nippawin where Paula Meal is on the line. Hi, Paula Meal. 
Hi, Garth. Good, good afternoon. I have first a, a comment about uh, the captured carbon being used uh, for fracking to bring up more carbon. I, I just find that bizarre. Uh, my uh, couple questions. One of them has been alluded to with the 50-year, uh, the uh, 2050. I think that's a far away number that makes it so that the government is a bit complacent about, oh well, we don't have to get too excited uh, uh, because it's, that gives us a lot of time. I, I can't see how even that target is going to be met because I don't see a whole lot of, of uh, decisions being made or attempted to be made. Uh, it, it's a slow process. Uh, my, another question is related to. Uh, nuclear energy. Uh, there are towns in, uh, in Europe where uh, there are uh, countries in Europe where they have mines underground with restaurants and whatnot and in the, some iron mines. And uh, it, would it be possible to put a nuclear facility underground where the, where the uranium is and all that's coming out of the ground are wires and so there's no movement of yellow cake and of all the other toxic uh, uh, ingredients to uh, making nuclear power. I, I, is that possible? Um, well, I'll, I'll, I'll tackle a couple of questions in there. You know, the, the challenge around getting to, to 2050 or trying to accelerate that, I think I spoke a little bit about that earlier, but there's a, a big logistical challenge of, of advancing those things. We've got you know, roughly 63% of our generation capacity right now comes from, from fossil fuels, and there's not a, a clear replacement of what we would replace that with in the near term. So that's a lot of the work we're doing right now. You know, as and with regards to the question about, you know, constructing nuclear powers facilities underground you know i think anything is technically feasible i think it would be a challenge economically you know we need to have cooling water we need to have access to employees to work there and things like that and likely that would be uh, so significantly cost prohibitive it likely wouldn't be an option that would look at. okay paul emil thanks for the call and thanks for the thought um just before we move on here we have an email from joan who asks why is SAS Power looking at SMRs? Why not use existing technology, can-do reactors? A Canadian technology has proven useful and reliable for uh, the last 60 years in Ontario. So uh, why not look at a proven technology like a can-do reactor? Yeah, excellent question. You know, you know when we say I'll say nuclear power has been looked at in the province for for a long time, and and you know it wasn't that long ago that there was there was looking or there was talk about building maybe large reactors here in Saskatchewan. And the challenge with the large reactors, whether it's a Candu reactor or other kinds of reactors, is they're just simply too large for for SAS power at this time. You know, our largest facility we have right now is about 350 megawatts, and most large nuclear power plants are double, triple, or four times that size. And for a grid like Saskatchewan, they're simply too large for us at this point. And so that was kind of why, you know, in the past, SAS Power hasn't looked at nuclear power from those large reactors. You know, what's changed and why we're looking at SMRs is that, you know, it's a new technology based on existing technologies. And uh, the benefit for us is that they're smaller size. You know, the, the, they range in size from 50 megawatts to 300 megawatts. So the, the type of technology we're looking at is about 300 megawatts. So they're better suited for the size of a utility like Saskatchewan. And um, so that's why we're looking at that technology right now. But but certainly in the future, you know, if we if we end up going down the path for nuclear power in the future, and certainly as load in Saskatchewan grows as we as we go out to 2050 and beyond, you know, certainly there there may be the potential to look at larger reactors down the road. But our system is larger and able to power. Okay, uh, to Eleanor now at Meadow Lake. Hi, Eleanor. Hi, uh, my thoughts are about nuclear power also. And I was just wondering, uh, nuclear power is noted for emitting heat and needs cooling, like we just heard, water for cooling. I'm just wondering how much heat can be permitted to uh, be emitted by a nuclear power plant and have it still called green energy. Yeah, well, certainly with any form of, of generation we look at, whether it's coal or natural gas, they emit heat. And one of the things you have to do for any of those facilities is you have to cool cool them down. You have to cool down the water within them. So they, they basically, whether it's coal or natural gas, we're burning coal and natural gas to make steam. You know, ultimately, you have to convert that steam back into water, and that's where the cooling comes in. Uh, certainly with nuclear power, you're, you're making steam through a nuclear process, but you ultimately still have to cool it down. And, and some of the work we're looking at right now is, is, is 
where is the best spot uh, to build that to be able to cool the water down. You know, a big part of getting any project approved, certainly a nuclear power project, will be going through the environmental siting process, environmental approval processes. And one of the things we'll have to demonstrate is that you know, any of the cooling water uh, that's going back out is not having an impact on the surrounding environment. And so that's part of the work we're doing right now and, and part of what went into helping us identify the sites we're looking at right now. What, what are those sites you're looking at right now? So right now, we've, for, with regards to nuclear power, we've narrowed down for our first facility, we've narrowed down to two regions. One is up in the Elbow area and one is down in the Estevan area. So both of these sites have been identified for potential for nuclear power. And the work we're doing right now is to narrow that siting process down to, to ultimately look to identify sites where we could construct a nuclear facility. They're certainly okay. not the only sites in Saskatchewan that would have potential, but these are viewed as the two best regions for, for a potential first uh, facility to get constructed. Okay, uh, let's uh, go to uh, Adolf in Regina. Hi, Adolf. Hello, Adolf? just one second. Hello? Hello, go ahead, Hello? Adolf. Yes, go ahead. Okay. Uh, well, what I was wondering, what I just noticed in my yard, I have a tree growing, and my, we keep cutting it down because we don't want it to get too big. And so I cut off all a lot yeah. of the branches. And every year it grows new branches. And yeah. it grows a lot more than a twig would. Well, because it's, or if it doubles in, a twig doubles in size, it only becomes still a larger twig. But a Okay, a uh, uh, tree, Adolf, I'm having troubles following you. Can you get to your point, please? Oh, the point I'm getting at is that that if you have that if we were to cut branches off trees and let the tree grow and use the wood as fuel, I don't know if that would be a lot of fuel or not. That might provide fuel mm -hmm. instead of coal. And the other thing would be to cut down trees in an area where there's high probability of forest fires, and that would reduce the forest fires mm -hmm. and provide fuel. Okay. Adolf, thanks for your call. Uh, let's move on to Mick in Regina. Hi, Mick. Hi there. Um, I just wanted to comment about uh, the net metering program. I used to really like that here in Saskatchewan, and uh, I think it was really beneficial for acreages in particular who wanted to have solar power or other sorts of renewable generation. But with the discontinuation of that, it, it kind of makes it difficult to uh, financially justify getting these renewable resources on your property. I look to the west in Alberta, and uh, when I drive to see family out there, I notice that on many of the small farms or large farms, there's there's solar arrays and there's wind power all throughout there um, because the utility pays them a little bit for their solar panels or the energy that they can produce. And so the, the landowner gets a little bit of money for doing that, but they also get free energy, and it seems to work with... Uh, within the, the, the climate action plan. Um, I also think that there's a really uh, nice partnership to be made between electric vehicles and these green energies that don't really run at night because you can charge your vehicle during the day with uh, the solar, the wind, and then at night it can power your home or whomever else. So I wanted to know if SAS Power has sometime, any in the, or sometime in the future if they're planning on bringing something like that back. So thank you very much. Okay, thanks very much for the call, Mick. Yeah, well, we do. I think we do still have our net metering program in place. You know, uh, is actually one of the first things I, I did when I came to South Power is helping to establish the net metering program, and 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 we went through a few changes. So we've changed the pricing mechanism, so what we pay for power, um, but we still have that that program in place. So customers can, through our net metering program, put solar or wind panels on their homes and and use that energy to power their their homes, and then any excess energy can go back to South Power. So that program yeah, but program is. Please. Doug, yeah. Doug if, I, if I may, just to, because we're going to quickly run out of time here. I, I'm sure. curious, though, with the net metering program, why do people get 7.5 cents per kilowatt hour for what they put in and have to pay 13.3 cents per kilowatt hour for what they take out? I mean, we're talking just about half. Sounds like a pretty good deal for SAS Power, but maybe not for the people making the investment. Yeah, well, the reason that, pro, that, that change is made... With to that program was for sustainability. You know, when we're paying 
uh, 13 or 14 cents a kilowatt hour for that excess energy. That's a premium of what that energy is, is the value of it is to SAS power. And that premium is paid by the ratepayers in Saskatchewan. So in order to get, continue to keep that program sustainable and, and have no impact on, on other customers in Saskatchewan, we revised the, the, the program to the current rate, which is uh, appropriate for what that energy is. Okay, uh, back to the phone lines. Warren is in Regina. Hi, Warren. Hi. Uh, yeah, the previous caller pretty well asked, you know, asked the question I was going to ask, but but I would say that, uh, you know, in, in Alberta, they, their private companies were actually paying uh, <clears throat> paying the, the producers of that had solar panels what they were, were charging them. So I, I don't understand, because when you change that to seven cents, you pretty well kill the solar solar. Uh, panel industry in this province for putting on <clears throat> onto uh, onto uh, commercial buildings and and especially residential buildings and and uh, like the previous caller was talking about with with the, all the electric cars that are coming in there's going to be a lot more batteries out there where that power can be stored even in residential places where that power can be used by the homeowner at night so. Um, as far as I can see, it's uh, what I'm guessing, or <clears throat> I shouldn't say I'm guessing. It looks like it's a political move to keep natural gas and the oil industry going in this province. Okay, Warren, thanks for the that, thoughts. That's thanks for the comment. Yeah. Um, Doug, there, you know, just, just, just to, uh, to Warren's last point, sure. um, that, that change that SAS Power made that, that we just spoke about. Um, We've we've had programs on this where it basically drove a nail into the uh, renewable energy uh, industry in this province. Was that the point? Yeah, no, that was, certainly wasn't the point at all, and and certainly uh, it wasn't a decision that was made lightly. I think when we started to look at that program and and the cost it was it was causing the SAS power. Certainly, I guess we'll say you know we're committed to ensuring we provide cost effective power for all of our customers. And when we started to look at the long term viability and sustainability of that program. That resulted in us having to, to change the price to be appropriate to what the value of that energy was, which was closer to that seven cents a kilowatt hour uh, basis. You know, we continue to always reassess these programs as we go forward, uh, and it's an unfortunate they've the consequences it had, but certainly it's something that it was not a decision that was made by. Does that mean the SAS power makes about six cents per kilowatt hour? No, I think the reality is when you're when you're generating that power. So when we're generating power, there's other costs that go into it. Certainly not the cost of the meter. Certainly there's there's infrastructure costs for transmission lines and distribution lines and substations as we move that power around. So that's why there's a difference between the value of that energy and what we charge our customers for. So to pay for all those other pieces that are required to make our energy system up. Okay, to Maryland now in Paradise Hill. Hi, Maryland. Hi. Uh, my question is, <laughs> was going to be what the, the two previous callers talked about, but I do have another one. Uh, because BC and Manitoba use more hydro, how come we can't have interprovincial uh, uh, cooperation and use use the green power? Yeah. No, excellent question. Certainly something we think of. We we do import some energy from Manitoba and we export energy to other jurisdictions as well. You know, there's a lot of hydro potential in BC and Manitoba and Quebec. A lot of that energy right now flows south to the US. You know, it'd be great to see some of that energy flow east-west in, in, in Canada. But the, the reality for, for energy in, in Canada, we're going to need significantly more energy in the future. And I don't think there's enough hydro potential in BC or Manitoba to provide all the energy required here in, in Saskatchewan, Alberta. Certainly, finding better ways to move that energy east-west, I think, would be a big benefit to Saskatchewan. And, but it would require large transmission lines to, to go between those jurisdictions. So it's something that's been talked about for a long time, but there's still some work to be done. Okay, okay and I, I do uh, wonder about that program that was axed, or you say sort of reduced, because we were looking at it, but then it seemed like it was a political decision and it, was, it just seemed to be gone, so we didn't go any farther into invest, into looking into it. So that's what I thought. It sounded very political. But anyway, mm -hmm. those were my comments. Thank you Thank very you. much. Thank you. Thank you.
Um, what what is uh, Sask Power looking at in 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 terms of of battery energy energy storage or or a form of of power storage? Yeah, no, batteries are certainly going to play a big role for for Saskatchewan and most utilities in the world. You know, we're in the in nearing completion of our first battery storage project just east of Regina, um, and we're looking at more battery storage. In the you know, there's a lot of benefits to battery energy storage in the province. You know, uh, whenever a wind is blowing or sun isn't shining, we can store some of that energy um, and then use it uh, from the batteries. So certainly we are looking at how do we deploy more batteries in the province on a, on a go-forward basis. So it's certainly something we're looking at. You know, there's other forms of storage as well. We're looking at things like compressed air storage and long-duration battery storage. You know, the challenge with the existing batteries is they can store energy, but only for a very short time. And so when we need power, say, if the wind isn't blowing or the sun isn't shining for a day or two days or three days, the current bad types of batteries simply can't provide that power over that length of time. But we are looking at new new types of storage. So there's new innovations going on all the time on storage. Okay, let's go to William in Regina. Hi, William. Hi. Um, I'm just wondering what your guest is uh, doing. And there, there's new technologies that are being worked on in Germany and California, uh, nuclear fusion, different than fission, that uh, basically provides very little waste. Mm-hmm. It's much safer. It just basically uses heat. And I know it's it's very early stages, but they're you know we're looking at ten ten year options and and uh, you know pathways to to forward. So. Uh, what is fast power in looking at this at all? Do we have any kind of research uh, following this? Uh, that's my question here, I guess. Okay, thanks, William. Yeah, I think I think what you're referring to is nuclear fusion, and certainly it's a really interesting technology. There's a lot of research going on that, um, but again, I'll say it's it's some time out in the future. And the challenge we have is as we're trying to make this energy transition now, we need to look to, sol- to solutions that are deployable in the next 10 or 15 years. But certainly we continue to monitor any kind of technology. And certainly nuclear fusion is something that we're aware of. We continue to monitor it and, and hopefully it will have a place in Saskatchewan in the in the future. But right now it's just well, not at yeah. the point where we can actually use it. And, and in fairness, uh, it, it's only been within the last six weeks or so that they've actually managed to get more energy out of a fusion reaction yes. than that they had to put into it. So yeah. it's, it's very There's early lo- stages. Yeah. A lot of innovation going on in the space. And the thing with fusion power is they always say it's, it's, it's 10 years out every 10 years. It's, it's, it's yeah. out in the future, but a lot of research is going on in, in that area as well as all areas related to, to energy and power. Okay, uh, let's hear from Marvin and Carrot River. Hi, Marvin. Hi. I'd be interested in your guest telling... Uh, the listeners, the program that SAS Power has for educating people on conservation of power and not wasting it, like, <clears throat> it seems like, it, uh, you know, the focus is on more, 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 <clears throat> produce more. Mm-hmm. We're going to need more instead of uh, perhaps, well, maybe we can save some power. Yeah. All right, Byron. Yeah. Yeah, certainly energy conservation is something we think about, you know, uh, just like with any other resource, we need to be mindful of how we use our energy and we need to use it wisely. The the reality is for Saskatchewan is that we are going to need infinitely or significantly more power in the future. We're moving to a future where where businesses will electrify, where people have electric vehicles and more things like that. You know, as we transition our way, way we generate electricity to lower emissions, more industries are going to electrify. And so not only Saskatchewan, but the world is going to need significantly more power in the future than we need right now. But it is a very good point. We do need to be mindful of how we, how we use our energy now, and we, we need to be uh, use it as, as smartly as we can. And as okay. we have, I also said, people have questions about that. We have lots of tips on our website at www.saspower.com. Okay, we're going to take one last caller. It's going to be uh, Michael near Davidson. Hi, Michael. Hey there. Um, I just thought I'd make the comment that uh, it should be no surprise that the SAS party political ideology is trickling into all facets of our life. And this is now including SAS power uh, regarding some of the policies regarding the 2035 uh, net zero mandate now being pushed out to 2050. Um, back a few years ago, um, it was all steam, full steam ahead for 2035. And now things have changed. And I feel like a lot of that is because uh, the SAS party is copying Daniel Smith's homework in the UCP in Alberta, and uh, it's just easier for them to throw stones at the feds when it comes to this. Another thing regarding the SMRs, uh, so we should follow the money. 
Uh, Brad Wall sits on the board of NextGen, a uranium developer. So it's no wonder that we're looking at SMRs. Also, uh, North Dakota wind progress has been incredible. How are we so different from them? They're literally 20 minutes across our border. And battery backup and renewables drop in price every single day while nuclear is going up. Why aren't we going full steam ahead with renewables until the SMRs come online? Doesn't make any sense. Okay. Um, uh, Doug, you only have a minute to answer, but please uh, give it your best. Sure. I think, you know, I think back in 2015, you know, SAS Power made a commitment to reduce our emissions by 50 percent below 2005 levels. And we've been for the last number of years been talking about a plan to get to net zero by 2050. And and net. Net zero 2035 was never on our plans. I think it was. It came out in the last federal election. So certainly, we don't believe it's possible to get there. And I think most jurisdictions are, are saying it's not possible to get there. Uh, but we continue to develop options to see how how quickly we can bring our emissions. Back. So, but right. I, I guess maybe in, in close, I'll just say you know we welcome all these comments. We're looking forward to hitting comments back from people. There's lots of opportunities to engage with SAS Power, and and you can find those at saspower.com. So we hope to get more input from the public on all of the plans we're looking at. Fair enough. So thank, Doug, you for- thank you. Thank you very much for your time, Doug. Doug Offseth heads up Generation Asset Management and Planning at SAS Power.